That was awesome. Thank you, guys. Uh, I cannot tell you guys how honored I am to be here. I love David Nasser, a friend. I love his heart for God. I love his uh, sense of humor. I love Liberty University. Um, we have several students from our church that go here. Uh, and so it's good to see, uh, or at least one, um, it's good to see some of them uh, today. Um, I, uh, I'm just very honored to be here. The church I pastor in North Carolina is home to a lot of college students uh, from the UNC, uh, Duke, NC State. Uh, campus is there, which I am grateful for. Uh, it means we don't have a lot of money as a church. Uh, college students uh, don't tend to be great givers. Uh, when college students co started to come to our church uh, several years ago, they all kind of came at once because, you know, college students seem to travel in herds. And so uh, in a space of about two weeks, our attendance increased by like 300 people uh, and our weekly giving went up $13.48. Uh, so we don't have a lot of money. In fact, one of my favorite memories as a pastor is in between two of our services, one of our um, ushers comes into my little green room area and he's got a, um, an offering bucket and in it is a bacon, egg and cheese biscuit from a college student uh, with a little note on it that said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I unto you. Uh, so we, uh, we do not have a lot of money, but we have a lot of energy. Um, one of the most common questions I get from college students at our church um, is about the assurance of salvation, um, especially if they come from a Christian home, a Christian background. Uh, many of them have prayed a prayer, um, but they just are not sure how you can know that you know that you're saved or if that's something you can know. Um, I released a book uh, a couple years ago called Stop Asking Jesus Into Your Heart, How to Know for Sure You Are Saved. Thank you, Dad. Um, and I would never uh, use your convocation to promote a book because that's kind of tacky. And uh, the Bible says somewhere that if you self-promote every time you do it, an angel loses his wings and a puppy dies in heaven. Uh, so I would not do that here. But I wrote the book because for years I struggled with the assurance of my salvation. Um, in the book, I explain that if there were a Guinness Book of World's Records for how many times somebody could say the sinner's prayer, I am absolutely certain that I would hold that record. Um, and, and this is what I'm about to say is not an exaggeration. Um, by the time between seventh grade and probably my second year of college, I prayed the sinner's prayer no less than I think probably 5,000 times. Um, I wish that were an exaggeration, but it's not. I don't know if some of you identify with that, but every single time I was in a service where the guy, you know, or somebody extended an invitation to be saved, I would pray the prayer because I didn't want to be wrong about it. Sometimes I would come forward and, you know, sign the card or, you know, talk to the guy or throw my stick in the fire. Sometimes I would just sit um, there in the audience and just pray it silently. It got a little embarrassing. Um, I've been saved in youth camps all over the nation of uh, the United States. I've been saved once in I think every denomination. I think every denomination has a record of my salvation. I got baptized, I kid you not, I got baptized um, uh, in my church, my home church, four times. I mean, it was kind of, I was like a staple in our church's baptismal services. Like anybody else besides JD going to get baptized this year? Um, they gave me my own locker in the baptismal changing area. Uh, that's how many times it, uh, it happened. Uh, that part's not true. But um, it, it all started for me. It all, it all kind of started for me when I was in seventh grade because I prayed a prayer when I was, you know, five, six years old, asking Jesus to come into my heart. And I, I thought, you know, been there, done that. I, I did the thing you're supposed to do. And I didn't really think about it. Um, seventh grade, my seventh grade Sunday school teacher had our Sunday school class over to his house on a Friday night. We were going to go bowling, and so we were, we were going to get us together at his house, and he wanted to do a little devotional before we left. And so he, um, he got us around in a circle, and he, he read Matthew chapter 7, which is the passage where Jesus says that many people are going to say to him on the last day, Lord, Lord, didn't we do you know, many mighty wonderful works in your name? And he's going to say to them, um, depart from me, I never knew you. And I remember he explained, he said, these were people, not, these people were not like non-Christian people. These were people that recognized Jesus as Lord. In fact, they, they were very active in ministry. They'd gone on mission trips. They'd done many wonderful works in your name. They cast out demons in your name. I mean, I don't know what kind of church you came from, but when you get selected to be on the demon exorcism squad, that's varsity, right? He said, so these people were, I mean, they were in, they were, they, they, they knew everything. And Jesus is going to look at them and on the last day, He's going to say, depart from me because I never knew you. And then my seventh grade Sunday school teacher looked at us and he said, some of you boys are going to be in that group. All right, let's go bowling. And that was the end of the devotion. But it, it threw me into a tailspin that, that lasted I probably seven, six, seven years. 
um, where I just could not find the assurance of salvation. I didn't, you see, for me, I'd, had, I'd prayed this prayer. I had no real relationship with Jesus. Uh, it, the prayer well, for me was more like a, a get out of hell free card that I, um, that I had, um, but I didn't know. I didn't know, I didn't have a relationship with Jesus, and I wasn't really sure how to know. Um, so that's the question I want to spend a few minutes on with you this morning. What is saving faith? What is it exactly, and how can you know for sure that you have it? What is saving faith, and how can you know for sure that you have it? Because it seems to me that, from the Bible at least, that there are a lot of people who have the assurance of salvation who shouldn't have it, and there's a lot of people who can't find the assurance of salvation who should have it. So if you got a Bible, I'd invite you to take it out and to uh, open it to the book of Hebrews. Um, Hebrews chapter 3, or if you're super cool and wear skinny jeans like David Nasser, and you have an iPad, you can pull that out or find it on your phone. So uh, you guys will be opening there, Hebrews chapter 3. As you are turning there, the first question we need to answer is, really, is if God even wants us to know for sure that we're going to heaven. Because, you know, a lot of people would say no to that question. They think that heaven is kind of like the carrot that God dangles in front of us to get us to obey. You know, kind of the, you know, you don't want to go to hell, do you? So you better obey. So it's in God's interest to keep us unsure so that we'll behave. Um, You know, if your biology professor told you that no matter what you did for the rest of the um, semester, you were going to get an A, um, you probably are not going to be motivated to study and and, and to, you know, to to do well on your test. But if you are unsure about your grade, then you're going to study. And people say, well, that's what God's like. He he wants you to always kind of be unsure. So he dangles heaven and hell out there like a carrot to, to try to motivate you to obey. The writer of Hebrews is going to say, in answer to that question, yes, absolutely, God wants us to know for sure, because God wants us to draw close to Him, His words, with the full assurance of faith. And here is why. Because God is a father, and there is no father who wants his children to be unsure about their relationship to Him. I am a father. I have four kids. They are all under the age of 11. When I left to come here last night, I did not get them around in a circle, and I did not say, hey, I just want you guys to know that Daddy loves you, um, that Daddy's going to be gone for a couple days, he's going to come back, he's going to bring some surprises for you and some, some candy, and then you guys should be excited about that. Or maybe he's not really your daddy at all. Maybe my real family actually lives somewhere else, and maybe I'm never coming back. Maybe this is a big illusion, and uh, you're not really my kids at all. So why don't you sit around and think about that while I'm gone, and let that compel you to become better children. There is no father that would ever do that. God is a father, and God does not want his father to feel that way, his children to feel that way. John 14, 18, before Jesus left, he said, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm your father, and I want you to know your relationship to me is secure, because love for God can only grow in the assurance of the love of God. Um, uh, That's why he wants us to know for certain that we are saved. Martin Luther, the the great reformer called the idea that God dangles damnation like a carrot in front of us as a motive to obey. He called that the, the damnable doctrine of doubt. The damnable doctrine of doubt. He said, sure, it will produce a level of surface level obedience, superficial obedience to God. He said, but underneath that is going to run a river of mistrust and fear and ultimately hatred of God. Um, When you're afraid of God, when you're afraid that you don't really know Him, you're never really going to learn to love Him. And what God most wants from us is not obedience. What God wants is love. And the the, the assurance of the love of God is what produces love for God in in us. So yes, absolutely, the writer of Hebrews says he wants us to know for sure. So if you're taking notes, let's look at that question. I'm going to give you four truths about saving faith from Hebrews, the book of Hebrews. Here is number one. It's in Hebrews 3. Saving faith is a posture. Listen to this and think about it. Saving faith is a posture, not a prayer. Saving faith is a posture, not a prayer. In the book of Hebrews, faith is always presented as synonymous with action. Here's your example, Hebrews 3, 18 and 19, and to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? See, so we see that they who were unable to enter because of unbelief. See how he uses those two words interchangeably? Unbelief and disobedience are the same thing. You know, it's interesting, in the Hebrew language, there is no noun for faith. Faith in the Hebrew language only exists as a verb because, listen, faith, biblically speaking, does not exist apart from action. Belief does not become faith until you act on it. An analogy I'm sure that you've heard if you've been around church is um, is sitting in a chair. Um, I can stand up here all day long and believe that this chair can hold the weight of my body. 
but it doesn't become faith in the chair until I transfer the weight of my body off of my legs onto the chair. Right? That's when belief becomes faith. You can believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, you can believe that He died for your sin, but it doesn't become faith until you transfer the weight of your hopes for salvation to, to what He has done until you surrender control of your life to Him. A lot of people in traditions like what you and I grow up in, they equate faith to the prayer that you pray. But if I stood up here beside this chair and I, you know, said, oh, chair, thou art a strong chair and I know that you can surely hold me up, I want to invite you to be my personal chair that I sit in. But I never sit down, then, I mean, if, 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 if the chair could hear, it would be touched at how much I love the chair, but it's not becoming faith in the chair until I actually sit down and transfer my weight onto it. The point is not the words you say to the chair. The point is the posture you take toward the chair. Well, see, in the same way, it's not what I say to Jesus, no matter how eloquently I say it or how much I cry when I say it, that leads to salvation. It is leaning my hope for salvation on His finished work and surrendering control of my life to Him as Lord. That's what brings salvation. It's not a prayer that saves you, it's a posture. Not one time in the Bible does it ever say a prayer will save you. It is your posture toward the finished work of Christ and His Lordship that is your salvation. You see, there's only one of two relationships I can have to this chair. I can either be standing beside it, trusting in my own legs, the strength of my legs to hold me up, or I can have transferred the weight of my body onto the chair. You can only be right now in one of two relationships to Jesus Christ. Forget about the prayer you prayed, you can only be in one of two relationships. You can either be standing standing in control of your life or having sat down in submission to Him, standing in the hopes that you'll be good enough to earn your way to heaven, or having sat down in your hope in His finished work. Which leads me to the second observation from the book of Hebrews about saving faith. Number two, saving faith endures for a lifetime. Saving faith endures for a lifetime. Hebrews 3 verse 12, back up a few verses. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. For we have come to share in Christ, watch this, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. The writer of Hebrews tells them that they, listen, are going to be saved only if they hold on to the end. In in chapter 2 he said it this way, Hebrews 2 verse 1, therefore we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard lest we drift away from it. Here he is um, giving a picture of salvation like a, um, like, a, like a harbor, and you're in the midst of a typhoon, and you come into the harbor of salvation. And what he tells him is, you better drop anchor, because if you do not drop anchor, and if it doesn't hold deep, then you're going to drift back out into the storm of God's judgment. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. That is different than how I learned to talk about eternal security. I, I was always taught that salvation was like a contract that you signed with God. And that, you know, you wrote a record of in your Bible that, you know, Billy Graham signed and your grandmother cried on. And and once you'd done that and you prayed that prayer, God could never renege on it. God could never go back on it. (laughs) I was taught to share Christ. I don't know if this may date you a little bit, but um, I was taught to share Christ through um, the infamous gospel tract. Anybody remember those little trifold presentation of the gospel that you would just kind of leave in random places or walk people through? I mean, um, it always had looks like a little booklet, you know, about salvation. Some of them were really creative. The worst one that I ever got was the fake $50 bill, you know, that you're supposed to leave for a waitress and on the back said, here's a real tip, try, you know, try Jesus. Um, if you ever do something like that, then somebody ought to punch you in the throat. That is the cruelest thing ever um, for you to do to a waitress. Um, and all our waitresses are very grateful for that. But all these, um, all these tracks, every one that I used, at the very end of it, after you led the person in the prayer that they were supposed to pray, all of them would have a statement like this. You're supposed to say to the person, now that you have asked Jesus to come into your heart, you've asked God to save you, He saved you, and you're going to be saved for the rest of your life. You're now God's child. Welcome to God's family. He's never going to leave you or forsake you. Congratulations and welcome to the kingdom of God. That is not how the writer of Hebrews talks about salvation. He, he wasn't like, okay, you prayed a prayer, now you're saved. He said, you're going to be saved if you hold your confidence firm to the end. And you're like, well, wait a minute, are you saying that we can lose our salvation? No. 
There are too many places in the Bible that teach you that you cannot. In John 10, Jesus said that once you belong to Him, you will, you will, He will never lose you. Paul in the book of Romans 8 uh, verse 31 says that everyone that God foreknew He predestined, those He predestined, those He called, those He called, those He justified, those He justified, those He glorified. And what He means is that once God justifies you, He will make sure that He takes it all the way to the point of glorification. Once God puts you on that train, He is never going to let you off. So, 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 no, I'm not saying you can lose your salvation, but, but watch this. On the one hand, you have the Bible saying that only if you endure in faith to the end can you be saved. And on the other hand, it says that, um, that, 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 that God, once He saves you, you will always be saved. Is that a contradiction? No. It just means that, listen to this, one of the necessary marks of saving faith is that it endures to the end. The faith that saves is a faith that endures to the end. A faith that does not endure to the end is not saving faith. No matter what it looked like at the beginning, if it doesn't endure, it wasn't real. When I was a youth pastor, I'd get really excited because, you know, we go to a youth camp every year and there'd always be, you know, like a, a, a girl who, um, in my youth group, would have this huge conversion experience. The Thursday night after she'd gotten one hour of sleep for every night of that week, you know, she'd have this emotional breakdown and she would go forward and she would cry enough tears that you could have, you know, filled up a lake with them and she would, you know, I'm going to love Jesus forever and I'm going to not, I'm not going to date again ever and I'm going to get rid of all my Justin Bieber CDs. I'm, uh, I'm not a believer in Justin, I'm a believer in Jesus now. And it was always really sweet and sincere. And I, I used to get really excited about it. I'm like, man, that girl's kind of, she's, you know, God really got a hold of her. But then how many times did I see, like, you know, two months later, three months later, she's not doing anything walking with God, and I would be confused, because it looks so powerful at the, at the time, and David, he's seen this too, so it was so powerful in the moment, I'm like, how was that not, what, how, what, did she lose it three months later? Jesus told a parable that I think explains this, it was the parable, you probably heard it, where this sower who scattered seeds, listen to this. There's a sower goes out and scatters seed, and there's a certain seed that falls on a kind of ground where the, the, um, the dirt is shallow. But Jesus said that these seeds spring up quickly, and they, you know, flower and they have fruits. He said, but then the sun comes out and withers them, and the weeds come up and choke them, and they end up withering away and dying. Here's the question, listen to this. Do those seeds that spring up quickly, do they represent saved people or unsaved people? They represent unsaved people who for a while look like they are saved people. Because the evidence, Jesus said, of saving faith is not the intensity of emotion at the beginning. The evidence is this endurance over time, according to the author of Hebrews. So yes, you see it is true, once saved, always saved. But it is also true, once saved, forever following. The sign that you have the faith that saves is not the intensity at the beginning. It is how it endures over a lifetime. The point is not the prayer that you pray. The point is if right now you are in a posture of repentance and faith toward the finished work of Christ. Number three, that leads me to number three. Assurance is found in a present posture, not a past memory. Assurance of salvation is found in a present posture, not a past memory. If it's true that saving faith is a posture, not a prayer. And if it's true that saving faith endures for a lifetime, then assurance comes not from a memory of something you experienced in the past. Assurance comes from the posture that you're in in the present. Let's go back to the chair. Every one of you that I can see at least are seated right now, which means that at some point when you came in, you made a decision to sit down. How do you know that you made the decision to sit down? Is it because you remember making the decision? Do you remember thinking, walking in, saying, wow, that chair looks like pretty awesome. It's polycarbonate blend. I think it can hold the weight of my 150-pound body. So I am now, right now, I'm telling my friends, uh, I am right now transferring the weight of my body to this chair, and it's going to be awesome. Here we go. Nobody remembers that. In fact, it was probably a subconscious decision, right? But the way that you know you made the decision is not because you remember making it, because you don't remember making it. The way you know you made the decision is because of the posture that you are in in the present. How are you supposed to know that you made the decision to trust in Christ? Not because you remember making the decision. Not because your grandmother was there. Not because you remember the words that you said. Not even because you remember when it happened. 
The way that you know you made the decision to trust in Christ is because you are currently surrendered to Him as Lord, and you are currently trusting Him right now as your Savior. You see, whenever the Bible directs you to find how to, uh, the way to find assurance of salvation, listen to this, whenever the Bible directs you how to find assurance of salvation, it never, not one time, ever points you to a memory from the past. It always points you to the posture in the present. So you remember this awesome moment where you asked Jesus to come into your life, who cares? You don't remember. You're like, I don't remember the day or the hour, I don't remember anything, but the question is not what happened in the past, the question is right now, the moment that you have in the presence. You see, many of us have this view of salvation all wrong. Um, I think i got time to do this. I want to um, demonstrate uh, to you. I need two volunteers. we got to do this really quickly, okay? I need a, for, well, here what I need. I need a guy who's sort of a guy that's got some, you know, <clears throat> to him, right? And I need a girl who doesn't mind having her personal space violated, okay? Um, so, okay, I see a guy right back here. Your hand, you come up here for a second. I need a girl right, oh, I'm sorry, I already got him. And I need a girl who you know, doesn't mind having her personal space violated real quickly, okay? Is that, is that you? People are pointing at you right now. Can you come up here for a minute? You are the audience's choice. Will you come up here? Will you do this for Jesus? All right, come on up here. You guys run. And now comes the awkward part of the sermon I didn't think about when it takes them 30 seconds to walk around. You guys beat App State this weekend. That was pretty awesome. I'm, I'm from North Carolina, and I still think that's awesome. Hey, will you, where'd the, um, the handheld, yeah, we, there they are, hey, there you go. Welcome our friends who are going to demonstrate things for us. That was the worst welcome I have ever heard in my life. Welcome our friends who are brave enough to walk up here. All right, so this is going to be real quick, and it's going to be, you know, I think it'll, it'll hopefully give you a, a point. What's your name? Chandler. Chandler. Chandler, you're going to represent someone who is really, really sinful and needs to get saved. Can you do that? Yeah. Okay. All right. And, and what's your name? Seth. Seth, okay. Um, Seth, you're going to be Jesus from, for the next few minutes, okay? Is that good? Yeah. All right. Okay, so here's how most of us see salvation. Um, so Chandler, sinner who desperately in need of salvation, comes to, have you ever met Jesus before? Okay, so this is Jesus. Chandler, good. You come to, Je here's how most of us see it. You come to Jesus knowing you need salvation, and you ask him for, like, a certificate of salvation. Please save me. This is the Lord of the universe. You should probably, I don't know, get down to your knees or something. I mean, this is a big deal, okay? So you come down, you kneel down at the altar, actually, and you hold out your hands at the altar, and you say, Jesus, please give me salvation, okay? Please give me salvation. Is this how it really happened for you? <laughs> okay, so um, Jesus loves, he wants to save her, so Jesus pulls out his salvation pad and writes out the certificate of salvation, and he gives it to her. And she says, thank you, Jesus, for saving me. She's so excited. So she hops up. She jumps up and down a little bit. Okay. All right. Good. And then she goes on throughout her life, you know, back, you know, in high school and various places and relationships. And then, and then she, you know, and then she wonders at some point because she's kind of, you know, feeling spiritually dry and she doesn't feel that close to God. And she did some of the stuff she used to do. And, you know, she feels bad about it. So then she says, am I really saved? Am I really a Christian? So she pulls out of her pocket the certificate of salvation and she looks at it. And she says, well, okay, I remember this, but maybe I didn't, well, remember I wasn't sorry enough for my sin. Maybe I didn't really know what I was doing. Maybe I didn't understand grace enough. What, so I better go back to Jesus. There he is, same place. And gets back down on her knees. He's motioning you because he knows what the drill is. And she asks him again. Well, you don't know if it's real, so you're kind of throwing that one away. So you ask him for another one. Okay. And she gives it, you know, right there. And then, and then boom, there we go. And we do this like 300 times. And every time you're like, is this certificate legit or not? That's how most of us think about salvation. Listen, and it is completely the wrong picture. When the Bible talks about salvation, it talks about it this way, okay? You come to Jesus, and, uh, and you know He's the Lord and Savior, so you hop up into His arms. <laughs> this is, yeah, do it. There we go. Now, right here. <laughs> well done. All right, so hang on a second. Didn't mean to put Jesus into a morally questionable situation, but <laughs> this is the new posture of salvation. So now, now when Chandler goes about her life and she gets over here and she realizes that she's wondering about salvation and she says, am I really saved? What is she going to look at to determine the answer to that question? 
The question is not what happened right here, right? The question is the present posture that she is in right now. The proof that you are saved is not the memory of what happened in the past. The proof is the posture that you're in in the present, right? All right, well, you thank Chandler and Jesus, Seth, a.k.a. married guy. Appreciate you guys. Thank you. Conversion, listen, conversion is simply when you assumed the posture. That's what conversion, conversion is simply when you assumed the posture of repentance and faith. Repentance and faith are a posture that you begin at a moment, but you continue for the rest of your life. And the way that you know that you began the posture is not the memory of what happened in the past. It is the posture that you are in in the present. So somebody says to me, I do not remember the prayer, and I say to them, it does not matter. What's your present posture? In the same way somebody else says to me, I remember the prayer, I was really emotional, but they're not in the posture of repentance and faith right now, I tell them whatever decision you made was the wrong one. Because conversion is a posture you begin in a moment but maintain for the rest of your life. Now I realize that begs this question or raises this question, is it possible to be saved in what Christians call backslide? Or to use the analogy, is it possible to sit down in the chair and then get back up? And the answer to that is most definitely yes. I do it every single day. Every Christian I know does that. Sometimes Christians backslide badly for extended periods of time. I mean, King David, you know, slept with a woman, um, murdered a guy, and lied about it for a year. I mean, that's a long time to backslide. But see, one of the signs of saving faith is that you keep coming back to the posture of repentance and belief. 1 John 5.18 says that sin will not have final victory over the believer. Philippians 1.6 says that once God has begun this work in you, He will complete it, which means He brings you back to the posture of repentance and faith. Maybe my favorite verse that describes this is Proverbs 24.16. Um, the righteous, listen to this, the righteous man falls seven times and gets back up again. Seven in the Bible is the number of completion. The righteous man falls, imagine walking in the mall behind a guy that fell seven times. The first time, you're like, <laughs> I got fell. The second time, you're, you know, kind of pulling out your cell phone because you're like, this is going to be awesome, right? Instagram or, you know, you, Twitter or whatever. The third time it happens, you're still videoing. The fourth time it happens, you're like, I'm feeling bad because clearly this guy's got something wrong. By the time this guy gets to number six, you're calling help because the guy gets up and falls. That's how God describes the righteous man. The righteous man is right, watch this, the righteous man is righteous not because he never falls, the righteous man shows his righteousness by what he does when he falls. It's because you fall down, see, and yes you fall, but what happens is God picks you back up and He puts you back in the posture of repentance and faith. So one of the signs that you are saved, or the sign that you're saved, our salvation is not demonstrated by never falling, it's by what we do when we fall. If you're in a backslidden state right here this morning, you're not surrendered, you might be saved, honestly, you might be, but you could never know it. Because assurance in the Bible is only for those who are in a present posture of repentance and faith. Which leads me to the last one, number four, saving faith produces a new nature. Saving faith produces a new nature. The writer of Hebrews, after warning the Hebrew Christians in the strongest language of what would happen if they fell away, says this, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation, Hebrews 6, 9. The writer of Hebrews is saying, I know, I know that you're not going to fall away. I'm warning you about what happens if you do, but I know you're not going to because I've seen in you evidence of this new nature. I see how your attitude towards sin has changed. I see how when you fall away, God quickly brings you back to repentance, and so I am confident that you have the faith that will endure. When you are genuinely born again, it is easy for other people to look to you especially people that are close to you, to look to you and tell that the change has happened. Because there is just no way that Jesus comes into your life and people that are close to you don't know it. Which means that if your best friends cannot testify to the reality of your relationship with Jesus and know it firsthand, you don't have one. If your mother cannot tell me for sure that you're born again, it's because you're not. When Jesus Christ comes into your life, he will make such incredible changes that everybody around you will begin to know. Hey, think of it like this, quick illustration. If I, um, if I'd been late this morning and um, after David and, and, and Kess had introduced me and the banquets and the bluegrass is done, there's like this awkward like, 
two minutes because I'm supposed to be on stage and I'm not. And then so like two minutes later, I come running in from the stage and I'm out of breath and I come up here and I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry, Liberty University for being late. You guys aren't gonna believe I was driving over here and on the way here, the car that I was in had a flat tire and the, um, and the lug nuts came off. And so I was trying to change the tire and, and I drop one of the lug nuts in the highway. And so I go out after the, the lug nut and, and I look up in the middle of the highway and there's a tractor trailer coming at me at 75 miles an hour and just hit me dead on. Not me like 65 feet, ran over me after that, couldn't figure out what happened, so backed over and ran over me again. <sighs> and I hated that, so I got up and I, man, I just, it took me a while to kind of, you know, shake, shake it off and, and I, you know, put the tire on and, and I came here and that's why I'm late. If I told you that story, you would look at me and say, you are a liar. There is no way that you could be hit by force like that and just, you would look different. You'd walk different, you'd talk different, you'd smell different. Everything about you'd be different at this point, right? What the writer of Hebrews says is there's just no possible way that the Lord Jesus Christ came into your life and you just continue the way that you are. Everybody around you will begin to see it. First John 2, 4, any man that says, I know him but does not keep his commandments is a liar. If your best friends cannot tell me the certainty of your relationship with Jesus, it's because you don't have one. If your mom cannot provide compelling evidence that you are genuinely born again, it's because you're not. Saving faith always evidences itself as a new nature. Four insights into saving faith. Men and women, listen to me. You have to get this right. Do not delude yourself into thinking that because you prayed a prayer that you're going to heaven. The Bible says in James chapter 2 that even the demons believe. The demons believe more than you do. You know why? They know He's the Son of God. They know He raised from the dead. They were there when it happened. So you're like, oh, I believe in Jesus. Congratulations, you've achieved demon level status with your faith. And those who have demon like faith are going to have a demon like fate. It is not belief, it is not a prayer that saves you, it is repentance and faith. Are you resting right now that Christ has finished the work of your salvation and are you surrendered to Him as Lord? There are others of you that can't find assurance no matter how many times you pray the prayer. And I'm telling you, it doesn't matter if you remember when you pray the prayer, because the point is not the prayer. The prayer is only good insofar as it expresses the posture. And if you sit down and take the posture without praying the prayer, it doesn't matter. But if you pray the prayer and don't remember in the posture, then you're not really saved because it's not the prayer that saves you, it's the posture that saves you. You can only be in one of two positions to Jesus Christ, only one of two positions. You can either right now be sitting in Him, trusting in Him alone as your salvation and surrender to Him as Lord, or you can stand in hopes that you'll be good enough to get to heaven or standing in control of your own life. Which posture are you in? Y'all, I remember when it all made sense to me, my second year of college, I was so bitter with trying to figure this out. Somebody told me that Martin Luther had gone through his own struggle with the assurance of salvation. So as a sophomore in college, I got his um, uh, commentary in the book of Romans. I know that's strange for a college student to, that's not the kind of book that you'd normally think. Um, but I remember on Friday night, sitting there going through multiple Friday nights, just going through trying to figure out how you could know. And I finally came to Romans 10, 9, Martin Luther's commentary on it, where he explained that Jesus had done everything necessary to save me 2,000 years ago that I didn't need to look back five years or ten years to when I prayed a prayer, I need to look back two thousand years to what He had finished for me on the cross, and that it was done, and all I had to do was believe in it, it was already finished, and it was rested, and y'all, in that moment it felt like the weight of the world came off my shoulders, because I realized that it was simply believing that it was finished like Jesus said it was, that was my salvation. Your salvation is your posture of repentance and faith based on the finished work of Christ. If you are afraid that you're going to be one of those that Jesus says to you, depart from me, I never knew you, I love what Spurgeon said to this. Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon said, Jesus could never say to me, I never knew you, because I would look back at Jesus and I would say, never knew me, Lord? Never knew me? When I had no hope of righteousness, I leaned all the weight of my soul on you. Day after day, I clung to you like a dying man clinging to Jesus, like a dying man clinging, a drowning man to a lifesaver. How could you ever say to me, Jesus, I don't know you? You promised me that anyone who trusts you, who leans the weight of their soul on you, that you would never be put to shame. I placed all my hopes of heaven on you. You cannot say you do not know me because I bore the weight of my soul onto you. Is that the posture of your heart right now? If it is, then if never before you were saved right at this moment. If it's not, I don't care what happened 10 years ago, 15 years ago, because salvation is a posture, it's not a prayer.
Why don't you guys bow your heads if you would all over this, this convocation center. I'm not giving you an invitation. I'm not asking you to come forward. I'm not even asking you to raise your hand. But do you understand right now that Jesus has done everything necessary to save you? You understand right now that he's done that. Are you trusting not in your ability to be good enough to get to heaven, but in what he's finished on your behalf is your righteousness? Can you feel yourself lean the weight of your soul on him? Jesus is not being good enough. That'll be my entry into heaven. It's what you did for me. Maybe you did that years ago and you're just kind of reaffirming it. You're believing it again. Maybe you're understanding it for the first time. Right now, who's in control of your life? To you or Jesus? Can you surrender? Maybe just renew your surrender to him. Jesus, I gave my heart to you when I was seven years old. Jesus, you are the Lord. Or maybe you've never understood it till now. And for the first time, you're adopting the posture of repentance and faith. Father, I pray that you would confirm like a father for his children the status of our position before you. And I pray that from this position, God, students in this room would go on to do the greatest things for you, to make the greatest sacrifices, would go to the ends of the earth, to Afghanistan and Indonesia and Saudi Arabia and to Dallas and Denver and Raleigh, Durham and everywhere in between. And that God, they would, because of the security of the relationship they have in you, would give up everything. God, but they would know that Christ is all that they need. And so they can be satisfied when he's all that they have. I pray for that confirmation through the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen.